hello. I'm gonna give it just a second and I'm gonna share to a couple places. Um, I had not planned on coming live, so I, I didn't create an event or anything. But I remember before I got sick in July, seems like forever ago, before I got sick, I had started doing what I was, I called, I think I called, getting into the word. I, I need to look back and make sure that's what I was calling it. But what I was doing was I was just sharing for a little bit some of the things that the Lord was showing me while I was reading his word. They weren't real long. They was just me popping on and just sharing, you know, from my heart, a few things that the Lord was showing me. So I want to get back to doing that. I definitely want to get back to doing regular lives like I was doing before. Um, but for right now, I want to get back into the, the short popping on and sharing some things that um, I am, right whoops, now. hold on just a second, that I, I am seeing in the word. Um, so today, I just wanted to share a story. I know it's one that we've probably heard a million times. I know I have. I used to teach kids church and it was one I taught often because it, it was a, a really cool story for one and another it just showed the power of God and another it showed how God could use even young people. So I know it's one that you guys have probably heard numerous times. As I go through it, I kind of just want to highlight a few of the things that the Lord has really been showing me. It, it's David and Goliath and you know so many of us are facing battles right now. Um, the world is facing battles right now. We just are all I feel like up against things that seem huge and we're going through major, major difficulties. So many people, I have people messaging me all of the time with prayer requests and my heart gets heavy because um, people are hurting and people need hope and people need to know how to get through battles. And so this is some of the things the Lord has been showing me and it gives me hope. And I just wanted to share that with other people. So I'm just going to kind of read a few scriptures and then just stop along as I go. Um, I will tell you, I am struggling with my eyes right now. Um, I haven't shared a lot about this, but I am still having some lingering effects of the virus. One of them, we think, is my eyes. Um, I, I've wore glasses for years and years, but since getting the virus, my eyes have gotten really, really bad. Even with glasses on, I have a hard time seeing, I have a hard time reading, um, it makes driving more difficult. And over the past week, it's really ramped up and gotten gotten pretty intense. So I'm having a lot of headaches, it's hard to, to focus my eyes. And I went to the, the eye doctor and he said that my eyes have changed, I can't remember the words he used, but significant, significantly since the last time I had glasses, which was a year ago. Um, he said he has not seen that big of a, a change and I asked him was it from the virus he said of course you know he couldn't say it was but that it is being seen to cause a lot of issues so we don't know if it is or if it isn't but just bear with me I'll try not to get lost in what I'm reading or anything like that so I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 I'm not going to read the entire thing um, but I do want to highlight some of the areas this is a great, great story, guys. If you've not read the whole thing, jump in there and read it. It's really good. So we're going to start, um, well, let's just start at the beginning. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled. And I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. Verse 2, Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they camped um, in the valley. Let's see. Verse 3, the Philistines were standing on the mountains on one side and Israel was standing on the mountains on the other. So like the picture we get is here's the army of God on one side and the enemy on the other side and they're staring each other down. The enemy had formed their battle stance. They were ready to go to war. They were ready to battle and they were ready to fight. Verse four through seven says, then a champion came out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor, which was overlapping metal plates, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze shin protectors on his legs. He had a bronze javelin between his shoulders. The wooden shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. The blade, so basically, he was equipped for battle. 
Not only was Goliath huge, he had full armor on. He had weapons. He was ready to go. Later on, it talks about that he had been trained from a young age to fight. So this wasn't your normal enemy. This wasn't um, just your run-of-the-mill guy out there. This guy was huge. This giant was massive. I would imagine to look at him, I, it would have been daunting just, just to be in his presence, to see his armor, to see how he was ready for battle. Huge. So verse 8 says, Goliath stood and shouted to the battle lines of Israel, saying to them, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not? I'm sorry. Am I not the Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? So he was standing there in verses 8 through 11. He was, he was taunting them. He was parading in front of them saying, look, I'm huge. I'm big. Who are you? What are you going to do against me? Just picture it in your mind. You know, you know this is what I like to do when I read the Bible. Um, I don't like to just read it like a story. I don't like to just read it for the words. I like to put myself in it and imagine what that was like. You are standing there and you are seeing this huge, gigantic man who is battle-worn. He's been through battles. He's trained from the time he was little and he's taunting the people of God. He's dressed from battle for battle and he's prepared for battle. How many times do we face battles and we start focusing on that battle? Because that's what I'm picturing. They started focusing on that giant. And as he taunted them, they got scared. They were afraid. The word says in verses 8 through 11, he was taunting them and they got afraid. How many times do we look at our battle and we don't even go to war because we get afraid? We see it. We see it raging in our life. We see it coming against us. And before we can even face the battle, we let fear overcome us. Sorry. We let fear overcome us and we run in terror because we get afraid. So many times the enemy is loud. The enemy is boisterous. He's ready for battle. That, that's what he does. He's been here. He's ready for battle. He's ready to take us out. How many times is that where our focus lands and we stop looking at anything else? I know I've done it in my life. It's easy to do. It's easy to get our focus. And are easy, it's easy to get tuned in to what's going and standing against us. So in verse 16, let's skip down to verse 16. It says, Goliath came out morning and evening, and he took his stand for 40 days. This giant taunted them for 40 days. How many of us know that the enemy is relentless? When we have a giant in our life, it doesn't go away quietly. It doesn't give us a break. It doesn't give us the weekends off. It doesn't quietly sit on the sidelines. It taunts us day and night. Whatever that struggle is, what, whatever that battle is you're facing, it never goes away. It's right in your face 24-7. You may try to get your mind on something else. You may try to ignore it, but it's right there taunting day and night. Let's jump down to verse 26. Here comes David on the scene. If you've not read this story, David was the youngest of his brothers. He didn't even get to go to battle because he was young and he was staying home watching his father's flock. So he was the youngest and he would go back and forth between where the battle was at, well, where they were setting being taunted by the enemy and where his father was at. And he would take provisions back and forth and he would take news back and forth to his father of what was going on. So in verse 26, it says, Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace of his taunting from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God? So David wants to know who he is. The first thing David asks is, who is this person? He's not looking at how big he is. He's not looking at what he's saying. He's not looking at how impossible it looks to kill him. The first thing David wants to know is who is this guy? Who does he think he is coming against God? See the different reaction? I mean, it is like stark ugh, night and day. The Israelites 
the army, when they saw him, they became afraid. They were fearful. They wanted to run and hide. David, he shows up on the scene. This little guy shows up on the scene, and the first thing you want to know is, who is he? Who does he think he is standing against God? Who does he think he is coming against the armies of God? And that's so much what we can do when we face things. You know, we, we have two choices. We always, in every situation, we have two choices. When we are faced with something, we can look at it and say, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We'll look at this thing in our way. Look at this, this problem, this issue, this sickness, this, this whatever, whatever it is. What are we going to do? Or we can come against it and say, what does this situation think it's doing standing against the will of God? What does this situation think it's doing coming against the child of God? And I love the way the first thing David says is, who does he think he is? In verse um, 30, 32, we're skipping on down a little bit, but go back and read this whole thing. It's so good. So David said to Saul, let no man's courage fail him because, because of Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. He was not afraid. He was ready to go fight. So here's this kid, young guy. I don't know how old he was. I've never researched it out. But here's this young guy. He shows up on the scene and an entire army is scared to death. They are shaking in their their shoes, their boots, their, their sandals, whatever they had on. And here's this young guy who shows up and says, wait a minute, I'll go fight him. I'll go. He knew who his God was, and that caused him to walk in total confidence of what he could do, his ability, because it wasn't based on him. It was based on the ability of God. He wasn't coming in his own ability and his own power. Had he been doing that, he would have had no confidence. He had to be coming in the confidence of the Lord. And I'll tell you why I think that's the truth here in just a little bit. Verses 34 through 37. I'm sorry, guys. I mean, I'm full transparency. I'm struggling a little bit with reading tonight. But I'm not allowing this to slow me down anymore. Okay, so verse 34 through 37. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock. I went after it and attacked it and rescued the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I seized it by the whiskers and struck it and killed it. Your servant has both killed the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God, David said. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. He knew what God had done for him. He knew where he came from. He knew what God had brought him through already. His confidence was not in himself. It was not in his own ability. It was in God. He knew that God had already prepared him for this fight. He's looking back over his life and he's saying, I've been through this. I've been through that. This battle will be no different. God brought me through all of that. So I know in full confidence he's going to bring me through this also. So many times we can be standing in a battle and we have our weapons right there at our feet and we don't even realize it's there because we fail to look back over our life and see how God has prepared us. We've all been through many, many, many things in our lives. We can all take, a, take time and look back and say, okay, God brought me through that. What did I learn from that? Oh, okay, I learned that. Oh, God brought me through this situation. What did I learn from that? We need to allow our past and, and the things that we've been through to build our, we our weapons, build what we, what, sorry, build on our weapons and build on the tools that we have to face the battles that we face the next battle, then the next battle, then the next battle. So many times, though, we don't look back. And I, I want to challenge you to do that. Look back and take stock. You know, we can go back in our entire lives. I can look back even before I was a Christian and see the grace of God on my life. And I can see his hand in my life and his protection and his guidance. And it's only by his mercy and his grace that he even paid attention. He doesn't have to, but because of his infinite love, he does. And there's so many things we can look back and, and use for a lesson in our ne next next part of our life and our next battle. So that's the first thing I want to I encourage you to do is take stock of the things that God has brought you through. Take stock of the things that you've learned. 
Um, what has he tried to teach you? What has he shown you? What weapons has he given you? Look around. I promise you, you have weapons. There is nobody that is weaponless. He has equipped every single one of us with something. We may just not recognize what it is yet. So verse 39 through 40. Then David fastened his sword over his armor. Okay, so Saul has given David his, his armor. He said, here, if you're going to go fight this Philistine, you can have my armor and you can use it to battle. So David fastened his sword over his armor and tried to walk, but he could not because he was not used to them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these because I am not used to them. So David took them off. Then he took his shepherd's staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the stream and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had. That is, in his separate shepherd's pouch, with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. So I picture this also. Here's David, and Saul gives him this armor. I can just imagine what the king's armor looked like. It probably was pristine. It was probably made out of the finest materials. It probably looked better than everybody else's. He was the king. It was probably in the best shape. It was probably the strongest. But it didn't fit David. David said, I can't, I can't even walk in this, let alone go to battle in it. I can't wear this. It's not mine. I'm not used to it. I've not fought with it before. I can't wear it. I can't wear your battle. And I think that's another, another area, you know, I've even struggled with in my life, looking at somebody else's life and saying, wow, if I had that, I could really do ministry with that. Oh, if I if I had that gifting, if I had that talent, if I had that ability, if I had that, I could really do that, do something with that in my life. But I think that this is such a fine example of we have to walk in what God has given us to walk in. We have to walk in our own anointing, our own calling, our own armor. God has equipped each and every one of us, and he hasn't equipped us to be the same. We, none of us are the same. We are all different. We all go through different, different things. We have to stop trying to pick up someone else's weapons, someone else's armor, someone else's anointing, and we have to recognize the ones that God has put in our life. Someone else's giftings and anointings and weapons will never fit our life. They'll be too big. They'll be too small. They'll be too cumbersome. They won't fit. We must operate in the ones that God has given us. He has equipped each and every one of us. And we must stop looking at the things that he's given others. And we have to focus on the ones that he's given us. There's, there's, well, I'm not going to go there. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward just a little bit. We are who God has created us to be. And it's so easy to look at other people's lives and say, you know, if my life was just like theirs, I would be able to do something. Or if I just had what they had, or if I could just do what they could do, then I could do something for the Lord. But he's not created us to be that other person. He's created you with the talents that he's given you. He's created me with the talents he's given me. We have to stop trying to put on each other's and develop the ones that he's given us. We have to search those out. Maybe you don't know what they are yet. Maybe you don't know the giftings God has given you. That is something you can definitely go to prayer with him and ask him, you know, Lord, what gifts have you given me? What talents have you given me? What anointing have you given me? Each one of us, I believe 100% have a calling in our life. Not all of us are called to preach. Not all of us are called to be evangelists and those types of things. But we all have callings in our lives. And with those callings come giftings from God to walk in those callings. And we have to seek him out and ask him, God, what have you put in my life? We all have weapons to, to come against the enemy. He has not left us weaponless. We are not just standing here naked and alone and afraid. He has equipped each and every one of us. We all have different circumstances in our life that we've been through different things. We all have been equipped in different ways, but he has equipped each and every one of us. And it's those things that we have to seek out. And in our quiet time with the Lord, it's it's then, then that we realize, okay, who are we? Who have we been called to be? Um, he is the creator and we're the creation. So it's time that we stop trying to dictate who we are and that we stop trying to, um, what word do I want to use? Stop trying to cultivate things that maybe he's not given us. It's time to take a step back and say, okay, wait a minute, God, I want to be who you've called me to be. 
I want to operate in what you have called me to operate in. I'm not going to try to dictate that any longer. I'm laying that down and I, I only want to be who you've called me to be and I only want to do what you've called me to do. Because I think sometimes we get an idea in our head, you know, that we know what we would like to do. We know what we would like to operate in. We know what we would like to cultivate. And we can get way off base when we start doing that. That's why we have to step back and be guided by God. He is the gift giver. He is the, the gifts are his and he is the one who gives them. We don't get to decide what gifts he gives us. We accept the ones he gives us and we walk in the ones he's given us. Okay, let's stop down or drop down, sorry, to verse 40. I already read this one, but I want to go back to it for just a second. It says, Then he took his shepherd's staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the stream. He took five smooth stones. I can just imagine what his little weapon looked like compared to Goliath. He had five smooth stones. I have no idea the size of them, but I'm picturing just a stone that fit in a slingshot, not very big, and a slingshot. And here he is against Goliath. I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen different pictures of, of drawings of what it would have looked like. It looked impossible. It had to. From the naked eye, people sitting there watching it, both sides of the armies had to be thinking, this is impossible. There is no way this guy is coming against Goliath. It's not even a fight. Goliath was probably thinking in his mind, I got this easy. We're about to win this battle. The Israelites were probably thinking, he's got this easy. He's about to win the battle. And the Philistines were probably for sure thinking, we're about to win this battle. I can just imagine how impossible it looked. How many times do we face giants in our life and it looks impossible? You know, we get that diagnosis or we get that phone call or this broken relationship or loss of jobs or whatever it is. Whatever the world, the enemy, the life is throwing at you. It looks absolutely impossible. And yet David never wavered. His confidence never, I mean, we don't see in the story where he ever wavered once, where his hands were shaking or his feet were trembling. He never wavered because he knew who his God was. It all goes back to he knew who his God was. He knew who he was in God and he knew who his God was. His confidence wasn't placed in himself. If we place our confidence in ourselves, we will fail every time. Because we do face things that we can't, we can't get through on our own. We do face giants that will slay us on our own. But it's when we stand in the confidence of God that we can come against anything and say, not worried about it, not going to stress about it, not going to have anxiety about it, because I know who my God is. Verse 44 through 43. Let's drop down a second. The Philistine also said to David, so now he's taunting David even more. Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the corpse of the the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel and that this entire assembly may know that the Lord does not sa does not save with the sword or with the spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will hand you over to us. So David knew that God was going to give him victory. So even whenever Goliath was taunting David, he didn't respond in fear. How do we respond whenever the enemy taunts us? You know, when we get that phone call or we get fired from a job or we face a broken relationship or the enemy starts whispering lies, he starts whispering fear, doubt, um, anxiety, worry. When he comes at us and says, you're not going to make it through this. How many gets those negative thoughts in your head? You're not going to make it through this. You're not going to see it end. This fight's too big. How do we face those those? those battles. What do we do when the enemy comes at us and starts whispering those lies? What is our response? Verse 48. This is my favorite verse in the entire story. 
When the Philistines rose and came forward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David ran quickly. He ran to battle. Picture that. Here he is. Not only does he have the confidence he's going to win, not only does he know who God is, not only does he know who he is in God, he runs to the battle. He's not afraid. He's running towards it. He is meeting it head on. He's not waiting to be defensive. He is being offensive and he is running to battle. How often do we run to our battles? That one gets me right here sometimes. <laughs> or how often do we run and hide? How often do we complain and question? God, why is this giant in my life? Why won't it just move? God, why don't you just do something about this? God, why did you allow this? Why is this even happening to me? He didn't sit on the sidelines hoping the giant would just go away. He didn't invite it over to have coffee and a conversation. He did not compromise with it at all. He didn't try to ignore it and hope it would go away. He didn't sulk and cry or have a pity party for himself. He didn't go into a deep depression wondering if God was going to do anything or wondering what was going to happen, wondering if he was going to come through, wondering what life was going to be like, wondering if he would ever get past this, wondering if he should just lay down and die. He didn't do any of that. He ran to the battle and it all goes back because God had prepared him. He knew who he was in God and he knew who his God was. He had no doubt. Do we really understand who our God is? Do we really know who he is? Because if we did, I think we would face every battle the same way. If we really knew in our heart of hearts, like my friend says, if we really knew in our, know how does she put it? If we really know in our knower, I love that, know in our knower, would we ever run from a battle? If we really believe the words that we read in this Bible, if we really believe that God is who he says he is, would we ever be afraid in battle again? Would we ever be afraid no matter what we face? Would we ever be afraid when we read the headlines on the news? Would we ever be afraid of anything if we really, really, really understood who our God is? Would we really ever be afraid if we understood who we are in him? I don't think so. I don't think we would be afraid. If our firm foundation was standing on who God is, I think we can face anything and say, no matter what, God is God. No matter what, we are in the palm of his hand. Yeah, we may not get the answer we want. We may not get the circumstance we want. We may not get the outcome we want. But God is still God. Verse 49. David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and sl excuse me and slung it and it struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone penetrated his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. To me in this verse when I was reading this um, yesterday, the thing that stuck out to me the most with this was we have stones also and we all have this weapon. This isn't a weapon that only some have. Every single one of us have it and it's the word of God. We can come against the enemy or any circumstance that we face with the Word of God. There is nothing that we can go through that the Word of God doesn't speak to. Every single situation that you could be going through in life, you can open up the Bible and find something that speaks to that. When we're going through any type of warfare and we're standing against the enemy, we can open the Word of God and find something to speak out against that situation. So every single one of us can use a stone that is the Word of God. Verse 51, and I know I'm skipping around. You guys go back and read this whole thing. But verse 51, it says, So he ran and stood over the Philistine, grasped his sword, and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their mighty champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah stood with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance to the valley and the gates of Ikron. And the fatally wounded Philistine... And the fatally wounded Philistines fell along the way. So basically, David um, used a slingshot, got, got Goliath in the forehead, 
he died. He cut his head off with his, with his own sword. So David runs over, grabs Goliath's sword, and cuts the, the giant's head off. And then the battle was won for Israel. I hadn't caught this before. Well, I mean, I knew it. I don't want to say I didn't know it. But this really stood out to me this time. Um, and I felt like the Lord was really highlighting this area this time that I read it. The fact that David didn't have his own sword and that he went and used Goliath's own weapon to cut his head off. What the Lord, I felt, what I feel like the Lord was showing me is that the enemy uses his words against us. You know, that's how the enemy fights us. He whispers things to us and he says things like, you're never going to win. You're defeated. He, he speaks depression on us. He speaks, speaks anxiety on us. He speaks doubt, fear, worry. Um, he speaks to our identity and tries to say we're less than what God has created us to be. He tries to confuse us. He brings all types of mental torment. That, that's really a big way that the enemy attacks us is in our mind. All of the thoughts, all of the negativity. So we have an enemy who is coming at us with his words all the time. And he uses those words against us, just like Goliath wanted to use his sword against David. He tries to pierce our hearts with his verbal attacks. But we can take his words and turn them around and use the truth from the word of God and cut his head off with them. So an example would be the enemy says, you can't win this battle. I'm too strong. Like, like Goliath said, you're not going to win, David. I'm bigger than you. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to beat you. You need to run off in terror. But what we can say is we can turn it around and use that same sword against him. And, re and say to him, that's a lie. Because the word of God says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. It also says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am who God says I am. I am a mighty warrior of God through God. Not on my own ability, but based on God. I am a child of Jehovah God. I am a child of the creator of all things. And nothing can stand against that in the name of Jesus. We can use the word of God to cut off the giant's head every single time. I've seen it work in my own life. I posted a, um, I was trying to think what I think yesterday, I posted exactly how I talk against the enemy. And it's things like that whenever the lies come. No, that's not the truth. That's a lie. This is the truth. Replace it with the truth of God. Let him know who you are in God. Let him know you know who you are in God. Because so many times that negative self-talk that you think is coming from you is many, many times the enemy. You know, we can think that it's just in our head. We can think that we're just thinking negative things. We can think that um, we can't control it. But that's not true. Your mind is your territory. Your mind is yours. If you don't want negative thoughts there, pull them down. Make them leave. Replace them with the truth of God. That is your territory, and no enemy belongs in there. And so many times it's the enemy whispering things to us. He is constantly trying to get us to believe his lies. In verse 51, when the rest of the enemy saw what happened to Goliath, they fled. You know, when we win battles in our life against enemies, they take notice. And with each battle that we win, we get stronger, we learn more, we're more equipped, and we can e more easily stand against the enemy. It's not that battles will ever stop coming because we have an enemy who hates us, but it's that we learn how to stand against the enemy. We learn more and more who we are in God. We learn how to combat the attacks of the enemy. The attacks will still be there, but we don't have to run in terror anymore. We don't have to be afraid anymore. We don't have to run in fear. We can be like David and say, I see a giant and I'm going after it. I'm tired of it being there. I'm tired of it taunting me. I'm tired of it being in my life. I'm running towards it and I'm getting rid of it. We can do the exact same thing. I love so many of the stories in the Old Testament where um, God was just with the people, his people, and they went to battles and he was with them. They faced things and he was with them. I love the New Testament for other reasons too. I love them both. But I love how God never leaves us alone. He is always with us. He is fighting battles for us. He is equipping us to fight battles. We don't have to walk through life alone. If you're feeling hopeless, I get it. Life is hard right now. 
There is so much going on around us. Everywhere we turn, there is another crisis. There is another fear factor. We are being inundated with fear. If you get on social media, you are being pushed towards fear. If you turn on the news, you are being pushed towards fear. If you talk to people, you are being pushed towards fear. Fear, fear, fear. It's everywhere. But we don't have to walk in that. We do not have to let that attach to us. We do not have to be afraid. We are children of God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are walking in relationship with him, you do not have to be afraid. If you are not walking in that relationship with him, today is the day to accept him as your Lord and as your Savior. Because, because if you're not, it is a fearful thing. It is absolutely a fearful thing. And today is the day for salvation. We shouldn't wait. We shouldn't put it off. We shouldn't say, when I get everything together, I'll come to the Lord. I want to have fun first, and then I'll come to the Lord. What, Whatever excuse or whatever reason we, we put out there, today is the day for salvation. We are not promised tomorrow. All you have to do is turn on the news and recognize we are not promised tomorrow. We are not promised the next breath. We don't know when our time is up. And if you don't know where you'll spend eternity, today is the day to get that fixed in your mind. Get that fixed with the Lord. And it's all about relationship. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about man-made rules. I'm talking about a relationship between you and Jesus Christ. I'm talking about getting into his word, finding out who you are in him, who he is, who you are in him and who he is in you, and building a relationship with him. It's all about relationship. So with this story, um, some things that come to mind that really like a self check, because here's something else I like to do with the Bible. I like to read it and then I, well, I like to do a few things. One is I like to picture what it was like then. I like to put myself in and think, what would I have thought? What would I have seen? What would it have been like? Like really immerse myself in that time. And then the next thing I like to do is say, okay, Lord, what are you speaking to me? What? Is it that I can learn from this scripture? Because I believe we can learn some, excuse me, something from almost every single scripture, if not every single. Um, I think that there's a lesson in there. I think that it's applicable to our life. I think that it is alive. I think that it is our roadmap to life, how we're supposed to live, all of these things. So I think that we definitely can learn something from everything we read. So I, I ask the Lord, you know, show me what in here is for me what can I learn and then I also look for just lessons like what are some life lessons even if they're not pertaining to my life at that moment just what is the life lesson here what can be gleaned from the scripture you know that we can learn from so some of the things from this this story that I, I thought on were looking at our own battles the, uh, the things that we face because we all have all have giants that we face and we all have ones that we need to conquer so the first thing is is recognizing what is the giant that we're facing you know what was the first thing David did he said who is this guy who is he who is he who is he to think he can stand against the Word of God the Bible also went into detail saying he had been trained from a young age it described what he looked like it described what kind of weapons he had so we have to take a step back and say okay what are we facing what what is really the root of what's going on here you know it, it looks like this but is it really this what is really going on here analyze it what are you going through what are you facing we may actually be thinking it's one thing and calling it one thing and it's completely different we have to ask ourselves, what are the giants in our life? Get specific with the battle. What is the giant's name and what is its agenda? Because that will give you specific battle plans and that will give you specific prayers to pray. I like to pray very, very specifically. I, I mean, there are times I pray general, in general, but whenever we can really recognize what we're going through, we can get very, very specific. Get the name of what you're going through write it down write down its weapons what all does it entail what all is coming against you if it's a sickness okay what are all the symptoms of that sickness so that you can pray against every single one if it has 30 symptoms write down 30 symptoms and the diagnosis across the top 
If it's that your house won't sell, write it down. If it's that you have a broken relationship, well, what are the problems in the broken relationship? Write it down. If it's that you have negative thoughts in your mind all of the time and they always come against you, what are they saying? Write down what they're saying. If it's that um, you have depression, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Whatever battle you're in, whatever you're facing, write it down. Once you write it down, start praying specifically for that. God, I pray that you would heal me of the symptom, blah, blah, blah. God, I pray that you would heal me up. Go through the list and be very, very specific. And then on the flip side, come against any enemy that is attached to those attacks. I bind and rebuke this. I command this to stop. I command this to leave. I command this to break. I command this to fall off of my life. I cancel every assignment of the enemy in this area. I always, 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 always do two forms of prayer and warfare together. Like I do prayer and I do warfare. I'm praying to God, asking him for protection. I'm asking for his intervention. I mean, of course I'm talking to him too, like just talking and listening. But when I'm doing like warfare, that's what I'm talking about. There's two sides to warfare and we can't leave either side out. One is praying to God. Asking for his intervention, asking for his protection, asking for his guidance, his will, his purpose, his plan, all of those things. But then it's also verbally coming against the enemy. We can't leave either side out. We need to be doing both. When you're interceding for other people and whenever you're praying for areas in your life, we need to be doing both. So whenever you are then going against the enemy, you are binding, you're rebuking, you're canceling with the blood of Jesus, with the name of Jesus, you're standing against the enemy in the name of Jesus. You are fighting verbally the enemy in your life. So make sure that you're hitting it on both fronts, whatever you're going through, whatever battle you're facing. Make sure you're going with both directions because so many times we can leave one out. We can just do one and we don't see, um, we don't see, uh, I don't want to say we don't see, how do I want to put this? When you do both, it's very, very successful. I'll just put it that way. When, when we do both, because I spend a lifetime of just, of I don't, and I don't want to say just praying, because God is God. God is unlimited. I'm not limiting God in anything. I am not saying that he can't move. God can do whatever God wants to do. But there are times, I believe 100%, because I lived it myself, that we have to pick up weapons and we have to fight. It's with him in us, because it's not us standing on our own, but it is um, more than us just praying, saying, God, please take care of this. That's part of it. But then the other part is us picking up our weapons and going against the enemy for our lives. I believe that there are incidences in the Bible that back that up. One is David and Goliath. Absolutely. he God could have just struck Goliath dead. He could have sent lightning and killed him on the spot. But he didn't. He had David pick up the weapons and go after him. Another one is the Israelites whenever they got to the, the promised land. He had made the way the entire time. And he had given them victories after victory after victory. When they got to the promised land, there was giants on their promised land. He could have struck them dead. He could have drowned them. I mean, he could have done anything he wanted to. But he told the Israelites to go kill them and drive the, them off of their land. So I absolutely believe in our lives it's the same. There are times that God just intervenes. He does it for us. We pray. He does it. And he moves in a mighty way. And then I believe that, well, I don't just believe it. I mean, I, I've lived it. So there are other times that he says, okay, I've equipped you. And now you pick up your weapons. I'll be right there with you. I'm holding your hand. I'm in you. I'm working through you. It is your, his power, not mine. It is him going to battle through us, but it is us using the weapons that we have. I hope that makes sense. I'm not relying on myself. I'm not relying on my ability. I'm not relying and putting anything on myself. It is all God. And in the stories in the Bible, it is all God. But it's two different ways that he moves. And sometimes in conjunction with each other. So the next thing we have to do is we have to ask ourselves, what are my weapons? What weapons do I have? Well, if you're fighting against the demonic, you have a lot of weapons. One is the word of God. Absolutely powerful. Two is the name of Jesus. Three is the blood of Jesus. Praise and worship. Um, fasting. Prayer. Intercession. 
you have a lot of weapons. Faith, hope, your salvation, the full armor of God. You know, we have a lot of weapons against the enemy. So sometimes we need to just sit down and take note of them. I'm big into writing things down. I like to see stuff. Write down what weapons do you have? What is in your arsenal? Because in your mind you may be thinking, I don't have any weapons. You know, what, what can I do against this? What, what can I do? Write them down. Whatever you're facing, write that down first. And then write down what weapons do you have against that? What can you do to stand against whatever it is you're facing? Then the next thing, the first two are equipping you. The first two are preparing you. Then run to battle. We can no longer sit on the sidelines. We can no longer hide from the fight. We can no longer curl up in a ball and become paralyzed. We have to fight for our lives. You may be thinking, well, that's really easy to say. You don't know what I'm going through. I get that. I do. I get that. There were years of my life, and especially for those of you that's never heard my testimony and that don't know me, I spent years of my life on the sidelines. I wasn't even on the sideline. I shouldn't even say sideline. I didn't even make it to the sidelines. I was at home in bed curled up in a ball ready to die. Years. 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 So I get it. I get that life is hard. I get that trauma is hard. I get that loss is hard. I get that it's painful. But this is your life. This is your life. Nobody is going to take it back for you. Nobody is going to... Nobody's going to take it back for you. It's time to get in the fight and get your life back. It's time. Yes, God does work through us. And there are times that God just miraculously reaches down and pulls us out of whatever we're in. I'm not limiting him. And please hear me. Hear my heart. I am not limiting God in any way. He can do whatever he wants to do. But there are many, many times that he sends us a wake-up call. And it's our choice whether or not we're going to heed it. Or we're going to ignore it and climb back in bed and pull the covers over our head. And I hope that if this is sinking into anybody's heart, if this is touching anybody, if this is getting your attention, let it be your wake up call. Get back in the fight. Don't let the enemy destroy you. Don't let the enemy take one more second from you. Don't let him rob you of who you are in God. Don't let him rob your calling. How many callings are setting out there unheard, unfulfilled, because we let the enemy run all over us? They're just sitting there. They've been laid down. They've been buried. They've been left behind. But it's still your calling. Whatever God has called you to, it's still yours. Don't let the enemy steal it for another second. If you have to dig that thing up, go dig it up. If you have to resuscitate it, resuscitate it. Let the Holy Spirit breathe fresh breath of life on it. There is nothing too far gone for God. That thing is not dead and gone. It may be buried, but there's still life there because God gave it to you. And what God gives, it has life because God is life. Pick it back up. Pick it back up because the enemy would like nothing more than to see your calling go unanswered. But it's time. It's time to get back in the game. It's time to get back in the fight. It's time to get off the sidelines and it's time to take your life back. It's time to answer your call and it's time to walk in your kingdom purpose. God has kingdom purpose for you. But if you're not in the fight and you're not winning your battles, you will never be able to walk in your kingdom purpose fully because you will always go from one crisis to the next, to the next, to the next, or you'll be stuck in the same one. We can get stuck in things that happened to us years ago. Been there, done that. I was stuck in it for years. I let it control me. I let it control my life. I let it control my marriage. I let it control how I parented. I let it control who I was. I let it dictate to me who I was. 
I let it tell me who I wasn't. I let it tell me what it, I couldn't do. I let it tell me who I would never be. I let it put me on a chain that I could barely leave my room, room from. And I let that happen to me. But there comes a time we have to break that chain. We have to break that off and we have to step into who we are. We have to step into the fight and say no more. It's almost like a light switch comes on. And I hope that there's at least one that listens to this and your light switch comes on and you say no more. I'm not going to let that happen to me. Not anymore. Because the enemy wants to lie to us and tell us we can't change. That things will never be different. That we're broken. That we're bruised. That we're scarred. But God. God says he makes all things new. When he makes all things new, there's no scars left. Those things that happen to us, we do not have to carry for the rest of our lives. They do not have to dictate who we are. They do not have to give us our name. They happen to us. They're not us. Yeah, things are painful. I get it. I get it. But if we're not careful... They attach to our identity and they limit us. It's like we go into a cage that we can't break free from. And then the cage shrinks smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon before you recognize it, you can't even move anymore. That's what trauma can do if we allow it. That's what hurt can do if we allow it. That's what rejection. Rejection does the exact same thing. Isolation does the same thing. They are all meant to paralyze us. They are all meant to get us stuck in who we used to be and where we used to be. I pray today is your day. I pray today is your day for freedom. I pray today is your day that you get your fight back. I pray today is the day that you wake up. And I don't say that unkindly. I say it from a person and a standpoint of someone who was there for years. I was asleep for years. I was in a coma, a, a spiritual coma for years. And I was so convinced that it couldn't look any different because of the trauma I had suffered. It was who I was. I was chronically sick. I was mentally ill. I had suffered trauma. People didn't understand. People minimized it. People didn't get it. I felt sorry for myself. I, I identified with trauma. I was in Facebook groups about trauma. I was in Facebook groups about chronic sickness. I so identified as it. I couldn't even see outside of it. I could not even see how I was anything else. If you ask me who I was, the first things that come to mind was the trauma and the chronic illness. Those were the first things that came to mind because I immersed myself in it. I cloaked myself in it. I was drawn to it. I connected with people who were chronically sick. I heard their stories. I um, embraced it. I embraced that part of me. I embraced it because I said, oh, but nobody else can understand. Nobody else knows what it's like. Nobody knows how bad it hurts because it did. I mean, there were times I felt like my heart was being ripped out. It did. It did hurt. None of this negates the fact that it's painful. It is absolutely painful. There were days I did not think I could make it through. But there came a time. There came a time when God showed me that was not who he created me to be. If you've not watched my testimony, you can find it on YouTube and it's the full thing. He showed me that's not who he created me to be. And if that's where you're at right now. If you are in the pit of pain and despair and sorrow, that is not who God has created you to be. You do not have to stay in that. You do not have to live like that. That is not the life that God created for you. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he came to give us abundant life. If you are not living with peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Jesus came to give you peace and joy. The abundant life, in my opinion, is life with him. 
life that says no matter what's happening, we have joy. No matter what's happening, we have his peace. No matter what's happening, we are abiding in him. To me, that is abundant life. Don't think it has anything to do with money. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with possessions. If it did, all the disciples would have been rich and all the disciples would have had the best houses. I don't think any of them even had a home. So I don't think the abundance in that, that verse has anything to do with uh, material things. I think it's all spiritual. And if you are not living that abundant life with him, he came to give it to you. It's yours. You just have to take it. You have an enemy that came to kill you, steal from you, and destroy you. But through Jesus Christ, you can have his abundant life. If you're watching this and you're saying, wow, that sounds really good, but I have no idea how to even get near that. Message me. Reach out to me. I'm here to help in any way I can. I, um, I've not been on social media as far as doing videos for a little while because I've been having my own battle. I've not been quiet about it. I've posted several times about it. I've been struggling with my health. Um, it's been a battle. And... Cognitively, I'm battling still. I, you know, those of you that have watched me before and those that are watching me now, you may be able to tell. I struggle cognitively. I'm struggling with my eyes. I'm struggling with fatigue. It's not who I am. It's not who I am. And I refuse to let it win. And I refuse to let it stop me. God has put ministry in my heart. He's given me a testimony to share and I won't stop period. And we have to get to that place in our life that says no matter what, no matter what the enemy tries to do, we're not stopping. We're not giving in. We're not giving up and we're not slowing down. Sometimes we have to refocus for a minute and take a break, but don't allow the enemy to dictate what you do and don't do. Don't allow circumstances to pull you from your ministry, to pull you from what God has for you. Sometimes we do have to set out. Sometimes we have to just really dig deep into God. Sometimes he's pruning us. Sometimes he's changing things in us. Sometimes he's growing us. Growing periods are not fun. <laughs> if anybody has told you that they're fun and great, I would question were they really in a growing period or a pruning period or a squeezing or a crushing when gra grapes are crushed, they're pulverized. When olives are crushed for the oil to pour out, they are smushed, smushed, smushed. Those are painful times, but they're necessary. They are so necessary. God has taught me during this, this time what faith is. You know, I thought I knew what faith was. I didn't know much looking back prior to getting getting sick I can now say I know I know what faith is do I know fully no will I ever know fully probably not that's probably you know there's some things we'll never know fully until we make it make it to heaven but he has grown my faith in this time tremendously and you know what I've been praying for a couple weeks before I got sick I've been praying for God to give me more faith <laughs> I've been praying that I would walk in faith with him. And it's time that's done that. Am I saying he made me sick so that he, he could grow my faith? No, absolutely not. I'm saying that he took what the enemy meant, meant for harm and he's turned around into a, a growth time for me. That's what I feel. That's what I think. We can lean in to hard times and we can say, okay, God, do something in me. Or we can fight him. We can be bitter about them. We can be angry. We have a choice. You know, we, we all face things. We all face situations. We all face hardships. And it's kind of like I, how I opened this message out with David and Goliath. David had a choice. When he faced down Goliath, he could have been afraid. Or he could have went in battle and he went in battle. We're the same way. When we face things, we can face them and say, uh-uh, I'm running from that. I'm afraid of that. We can cry, we, we can get sad, we, we can get depressed, we can we can go to do all of these things and say, nope, not, not going there. We can get full of fear. 
or we can face them and say, you know what, I don't know what the outcome will be. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know who my God is. And I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be fearful. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be bitter. How many times do we get angry and bitter over things that we don't understand? You know, we, we go through things and we get angry and bitter because we don't understand why we have to go through them. We think that it's unjust. And we look at God and say, well, that's not fair. It's not the way it should be. I'm serving you. And it's not fair that I have to go through things. But I would challenge us. Who are we to question God? Who are we to question anything that he does? If we could really, really grasp that God is God. And we are not. He knows all things. He sees all things. He is all things. Who are we to question the creator? We are the creation. We are the creation and he is the creator. And I really feel like if we could just have a shift in our focus and our understanding, we are not owed anything. God doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't owe us because we serve him. He doesn't owe us because we give our lives to him. We owe him everything. We lay our lives down to him because we owe him that. Jesus Christ paid a price for our salvation. Whenever we accept him as, as Lord and Savior, we are indebted to him. We owe him everything. I forget exactly where it's at. I'd have to look it up. But Paul says it's our reasonable sacrifice to lay our lives down on his altar. Reasonable sacrifice. If we truly accept him and we come into covenant with him, we are indebted. Our life is no longer our own, and we owe him. He doesn't owe us an explanation. And I'm not chastising anybody. I am talking about things that the Lord has taken me through. Everything that I share, pretty much, I would say 99.99% .99 of the messages that I share and the things that I say are things that the Lord has taken me through at some point in my life. So I am never on here pointing my finger at anybody. I'm sharing things that have helped me in my walk in the hopes and prayers that it helps you in your walk. I hope you hear and see my heart in that. But I just think we need to get to a place where we don't resist God. We don't resist his plan because we know that his plan is a good plan. It may not be what we want. It may not look like we want it to look like. It may not have the outcome we want it to have, but God's plans are higher than ours. And this earth is not our home. We are not home. This is not where we belong. We are just passing through. We are foreigners in a foreign land and we are passing through. Our home is in heaven with him. We belong with our father. We are here, but for such a small amount of time. We're here to make a difference in the lives of others, to bring glory to God and to bring others to God. And when we can really shift our focus to the eternal and not get so stuck in the temporal, in the here and now, in the right this moment, things really start to fade away that we thought were so important and that mattered so much and that we're, we're so fixated in our minds. They just aren't as important. So I think I'm going to close. I didn't mean to go this long. Um, normally when I get on these things, I think, will be a lot shorter. The ones where I do getting in the word is what I called it. Um, but the Lord's laid a lot on my heart lately. A lot. And this was some of it. Um, I went in a lot of different directions. But he's laid a lot on my heart lately. And I'm excited for what he's doing. It's been a it's been a difficult couple few months, um, but I'm excited. Like nothing takes away from my excitement. I'm excited in what the Lord's doing. I'm excited in the ministry. I'm exciting for excited for the things that are coming up. I have a book getting ready to be published very very soon. Um, I have a few more projects that he's given me to write, which is really exciting. I have a few conferences that I've been invited to um, do some speaking at, so that's exciting. He's doing some really amazing things. 
in the midst of a battle. And I say that to encourage you, even if you're going through a battle, don't close your door to ministry that you can do. Don't let the battle take your focus because that's exactly what the enemy wants. He, he wants to put things in your life that stop you from doing ministry and stop you from walking in the call that God has given you. So regardless of what you're, what's going on, yeah, you may need, to, may need to rest, may need to take some time off, may need to do this or do that, but just don't stop. Don't get stagnant. Wherever you're at in your walk with the Lord, don't get stagnant. Don't let the enemy steal your focus. And if he has, refocus. It's a prayer away. Your refocus is a prayer away. If you've walked away from the Lord, he is literally a prayer away. If you've never known the Lord, he's a prayer away. You can take care of whatever you're facing in the next couple minutes. Right now. Don't put it off. Good night, you guys. Talk to you soon. Watch my page for upcoming um, live events. I plan on scheduling some stuff here pretty soon. Good night.